These, these are just some of the things that need to be done. And then, of course, accountability and flexibility. They must be accountable and um, the staff, not based on how they get countries to, to stick to orthodoxy, but their, their performance and well-being must be linked to, the, to countries doing well on the ground. Um, in the World Bank, I think the mandate should change too, that they should focus on just a few things. They're trying to be everything to everyone now. And, and that's not a good use of resources. Yes. So the environment, if, it's, it, if it is going to become so ca catastrophic, and, and um, all the work done so far, the IPCC has shown and, and proven the case from a scientific perspective that any change in world temperature above two degrees Celsius would be catastrophic. They have indicated that for us to maintain those levels that by 2030, you have to stabilize atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases to about 450 parts per millimeter of CO2 equivalent. That's two tons of carbon per capita. The US now produces 20 tons of carbon per capita. India is at two, China is at five. So it means deep emission cuts and it means a lot of attention to this. And the, the economics of climate change has been done by Stern Review. It shows that action today will be, will be most, more cost effective than the consequences in the future. So you have to focus on it. It's going to change the whole world and, and, and in catastrophic ways too. So, so I think the World Bank mandate should focus on that. Lending for clean energy, um, the environment, and certain aspects of poverty reduction. Not everything, maybe education and healthcare in, in, in developing countries. Um, we, we have the United Nations agencies. Clearly, the Security Council needs to be reformed. Um, and, and ECOSOC has to, to play a more independent role in, in, um, in the economic sphere. So if you ask me what are the, maybe the, the major principles, I would say today, guiding the creation of new institutions, that is relevance in the, of, of the mandate, flexibility, legitimacy, accountability, effectiveness. These are principles around which new governance structures should be created, and the old ones evolve to match, match, match those principles. Um, I, I did some work with, with some of the Commonwealth leaders, and we're going to present that work tomorrow to other Commonwealth heads. And what we have asked for is a new Bretton Woods type of conference um, to, to re-examine all of these institutions to see that they are relevant. The one that is particularly close to my heart is as we evolve a new governance structure for the environmental sector, we need to pay particular attention to the post-Kyoto um, framework, the post-2012 framework, to see that all the sources of greenhouse gases are tackled. And in my, my country's case, um, the forest, it's densely covered with forests. So, um, but, and forest deforestation contributes some 20% of greenhouse gases. Yet in, in the Kyoto Protocol, forests are not included. And um, in the discussions that are taking place now, it seems highly unlikely we'd get, we'd get major input of forests into the trading mechanism, the carbon trading mechanism. We think it's unfair carbon emitted or, or sequestered in Europe is treated differently than carbon emit, emitted or sequestered through rainforests, uh, although they have the same impact on the world, because carbon emitted anywhere would contribute to global warming. So we think it's unfair, and um, that, the, because that will be the foundation for a new global governance structure in the environment. So that's an immediate task for us as we lobby in the future. Um, I, I noticed that it was asked how ad agencies can help in this. 
And I think, I think the problems are more fundamental than just a PR exercise, but public relations does help. Um, for example, in the United Nations gets a bad image because a few congressmen in the U.S. would go about saying, you know, publicly and in the U United States of America, the U.N. frustrates American um, policy in, in different areas. So already, and this is, this is given wide coverage in the society, so the U.N. gets a bad image. Take, for example, the, the oil scandal in Iraq. Um, this was an indictment not of a program in the United, the, the United Nations, big, the way it was portrayed, but of the whole United Nations. Um, take, for example, third world leaders. Often in the mainstream media, people don't, I think in, in ordinary people have this view that third world leaders are, are dictators or corrupt and they have bank accounts in Switzerland. So how can you go and ask them for more money to assist in poverty or helping these countries? I recall how, how effective it is when ordinary people get on board, when they are briefed. In Birmingham in the, 1970, um, the 1990s, I was Minister of Finance at that time, and I went with Anne Pettifor and the others, and we they were the first meeting of Jubilee um, the debt relief campaign. And it became so effective because it started with ordinary people from Middle England who were, because they used their hearts, Christian people. And um, their campaign spread like wildfire. And that put debt relief, multilateral debt relief, on the agenda of the G7. Tony Blair couldn't ignore it. He sent for the organizers immediately. So when you get people involved through the right imagery, and they write messages from these institutions. You can, you can do wonders, and you can get that. It's easier, it's easier for the policy makers to, um, to, to have progressive policies, especially in the developed countries of the world, if they have broad-based support. Thank you very much.